and it is now my great pleasure to introduce Hyde Erdrich. If you visit the website HydeErdrich.com, you will find a modest biography saying that she is the author of seven collections of poetry, a nonfiction indigenous foods memoir, and she's editor of two uh, anthologies. She grew up in Wapatan, North Dakota, and is Ojibwe enrolled at Turtle Mountain. I have some of her books here, just, just, you know, a little few of them. And she also makes amazing videos. Um, and, but what her website will not tell you is that if you have the courage to delve into her substantial work, you will discover that Hyde E. Erdrich is a poet working in the vast realm of prophetic imagination. A few weeks ago, I followed a series of blog posts from the Center for Action and Contemplation, reflections on the life-sustaining necessary work of the poet prophets among us. I believe that all of our poets tonight work in this realm. Hyde has been doing it magnificently and humbly for decades. Poet prophets have the prescience and courage to work outside and at a distance from the court of common religious and civic opinion. They are willing to risk unpopularity and even derision in order to challenge humanity to let go of illusion. And they are imbued with profound love for creation and a consequent passion for justice. That, beautiful people, is Hyde E. Erdrich. We are all a little bit in awe of her. We are grateful for her, and we are honored that she is with us tonight. Please welcome Hyde E. Erdrich. I can barely speak. That was so kind. Um, Buju and Dinaway Magani dog, Buju Nij and Nishinabe dog, Hyde Erdrich and Jinikaz Jaganashimong, Maji Kwe Indigo, Wapetun, Wapetun, North Dakota, Dakota King, Indunjaba, Gaye, Makrek Wajuing, Triple Mountain. These are the places I'm from, Makwan Dodum. Uh, my name is Hyde Erdrich in English, and the rest was my Ojibwe greeting, um, and I'm so pleased to be here tonight with Louise. It is always exciting. The depth of this book um, just keeps coming to me level after level. I keep giving it away. I've got a whole bunch of copies now, so hopefully um, I'll be able to get assigned one before uh, too long. I've had all my shots, so come on by. <laughs> and um, and then, and the same thing with Sue and everybody else who had a book in the past year and a half. I, I just can't wait to um, be in people's presence again and, and hold my book out to you and have you put your name on it. So I'm really looking forward to that. <clears throat> I feel totally, totally blown away by that um, introduction. So I got to get back. Um, I'm going to start with this poem by... Louise, that is uh, really perfect for me this past week. We've had a lot of thunder and lightning, and um, there's so many things about it that have a new level of meaning for me, especially as an Anishinaabe Kwe, as an Ojibwe woman, whenever I read it. So I'm going to try to do it justice. Way Wayne. What a wake of a thunderstorm. Fractured pine branches disintegrated leaves, rotten, returning to the dampened earth, tangled within dissolves of silenced six-mile secrets, etching steps throughout graveyards and reservation allotments of historical trauma, demolishing oil pipes, piercing my tribal homeland. So that's this beautiful poem, Way Wayney. This is a tear stuck right here, folks. Thank goodness I have a napkin on my lap. And um, I'm looking forward to talking about that. But thinking about reading that poem um, gave me a chance to read this poem of mine as a sister poem to Louise's. And it's called, Territory Was Not Virgin and Neither Was I Virgin. Born overflowing, all giving, you never could take what we never gave, what I held back, sky fat with rain, 
water dropping my name slowly on my lips. No part of me you could remove from this water. She touches everything, never alone. So even what you broke blew up, bomb of droplets, collective thunder sounding, sounding, resounding. No wonder you grew afraid. My voice refused you, all of you. Erased even the names, faces, places you tried to take us. So only a steady music remains, the urgency of rain. Neither could you take it with your cannon that turns sound against bodies. Profound vibration shot through bone, shock to the ears, the brain, the dreams, or water cannons, water usurped, turned to weapon, turned to ice, turned to burn. They waded away with water, took water back, dispersed the hurt across the globe, the globe of water, the only territory, the only country, the only kinship, the one we would not give. If we give ourselves to anything, we give ourselves to water. If I give myself to anything, I give myself to water, not bride or prize or slave, but daughter, then grown woman, then wave, next to wave, next to wave. No more yours than rain, rain dropping slowly, so even you could hear it, knows you, knows your name. So that is, um, territory was not virgin and neither was I virgin. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the connection I felt to Wei Waini was, of course, the idea of thunder and water and the incredible power of it. And this poem was written as uh, a, a, a healing to friends who had spent time at Standing Rock and who had been so terribly assaulted with water cannons and with sound cannons. And my feeling of connection and the root of my question for Louise is that in our poems I see often levels of teachings and Ojibwe learning that we as women hold and um, you know the responsibilities we hold uh, particularly for protecting the water and Weiwaini um, is is what I was always told when somebody tried to teach me a lesson um, do it correctly be careful uh, and also just a way to, to tell people to take care of themselves sometimes. And so I, my question is, how are you negotiating the parts of the work, the levels of the work culturally and the language? And how has that um, worked for you? Where are you going with it? And let, it, let folks know a little bit more about that connection. Thanks. Uh, Hyde Erdrich, ladies and gentlemen, oh my goodness. Um, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, before I get into that, this is kind of totally off topic, but I don't, are people in the waiting room still being allowed in or is that, um, is that up on, okay. I have, a, I have a cousin in there who's impatiently um, sitting in the waiting room and kind of yelling at me. Um, <clears throat> back to uh, <laughs> right um back to your back to your question hopefully i can answer this um properly um <clears throat> so growing up i i have my father's side of the family and i have my mother's side of the family which also means um i had to go through being too brown for the white kids and too pale for the native kids and then there's this um, there's this aspect of reserva reservation life and urban life, and so I was constantly being pulled in in multiple directions, right? And and in that, not knowing how to stand firmly on my own foundation, um, losing losing myself in that, and so through unhealthy coping mechanisms and life circumstances, I found myself completely broken and needed to come back home. And an essential part of that travel was learning the Ojibwe language. 
and allowing that not only to kind of come off my tongue, but reside inside my body. I grew up on the lake. I grew up in the woods. I grew up hearing the language, seeing the connection, the powerful connection of Ojibwe language to its people, to my people. And who am I to say, I will not use the Ojibwe language? My mother is still, is still here and she probably, she still gives that look. You know, if, if anybody knows that mother's look, I, I still get it. So uh, the Ojibwe language is integral to who I am. And so if my poetry is integral to who I am, Ojibwe language is integral to my poetry. And there may be multiple conversations about the, the dying aspect of Ojibwe language. It's not dying. Our culture and our language are being revolutionized in a way where our children are in Ojibwe immersion schools, where we see unfortunate circumstances like pipelines and um, our natural resources being pulverized and raped. And we see signs with our indigenous languages on them and non-indigenous speakers know what they say because our languages are such a part of who we are. And so as a writer, if I ever want to be not only true with myself, but if I want my readers to be able to connect with that, I will always use Ojibwe language. And how important is that? And so it is in text. It's available through uh, multiple dictionaries due to the hard work of, of many um, students and elders and and, and speakers and, and teachers and students, so all collaborating together to make that out there. But also just listening to our elders speak. They have stories and they have wisdom and they have these gems and they have this uh, pure beauty about them. And so that, that, that's part of my uh, responsibility is to listen to them and allow them to have that space and to speak our language for them to be true to themselves, for our children and the next seven generations that are going to follow to know that it is damn okay to be Ojibwe and to speak your language. Uh, Hyde, I hope I answered your question. I can dance around the Powell grounds a lot, um, but wonderful question. Thank you.